Alrighty, let's get started. So a quick announcement before we begin. Um, after due consideration, um, doing a full release of checkpoint of the Checkpoint 1 reference implementation basically turned into a bit of a logistical nightmare. Um, it is not feasible. However, um, what I have released last night is an implementation of the reference implementation's query plan as well as the translation layer that converts SQL to that query plan. Um, there is no evaluation code. However, there are a few utility classes that may be of use uh, to, uh, to people doing optimization as well. Um, the code is released. There's a Java doc for it. Um, but this code is basically released as is. Um, if you have any questions about it, um, I can't answer them. OK. Um, so last class, we talked about, uh, talked about cost-based optimization. Um, there are a number of situations where a query has, uh, there are several different plans for a query, all of which are equivalent. Um, in other words, we can transform one into the other, but we don't necessarily know which of them, uh, at least just by looking at the query, we don't know necessarily which of them is going to be the best. Um, and the canonical example of this that we brought up was join uh, was uh, join equivalencies. So given all of the possible ways of rewriting this query, how many ways could I potentially structure this query? Hmm? For, uh, could you speak up? Sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, you're using a word after four that I'm, I'm not... Oh, four, uh, four choose two? Why, why are you... Okay. Um, where did that come from? Four factorial. Okay, so four factorial. Where, where, is, uh, where is that coming from? Okay, so there are uh, four different tables. And I can order them in pretty much any order I want. The first table, is I pick one. Uh, the second table, uh, sorry, the first table, I have four choices for it. The second table, I have, um, uh, the sec second table, I have three choices for, and, and so forth. Um, is that all that I have here? So I could, uh, where are we? I stole all the chalk. Uh, OK. Do I have backup chalk? Yes. All right. So uh, yeah. the board is way too big. All right, so I have, I can choose one of four different things for the first query. I can choose uh, one of four different things for the second join operand. Oops. And then I can choose a bunch of things for the next operand and so forth. Is there anything else I could be doing to restructure this query? So even if I order them R join S join T join U, do I have, with this specific ordering, do I have any other flexibility in how I process it? OK, so I can change the parenthesization as well. Uh, I could do R join S. I could evaluate that parenthesization. I could evaluate 
that parenthesization, I could do this in even more different ways. Uh, so actually, it's not just n factorial, it's n factorial factorial. n factorial times n minus 1 factorial. So there are a huge number of different ways that I could evaluate this plan. And ultimately, I don't want to have to go through every single one of them. So way, way back, probably before any of you were born, um, a, a system called uh, System R uh, came out that essentially recognized this problem. There are way too many different query plans for me to optimize. So instead, I'm going to restrict myself to a single, uh, a single plan structure. In other words, all of my plans are going to be what's called right deep, uh, left deep. In other words, the right hand relation is always going to be a relation. So I start with some table, let's say u, and then I kind of gradually apply each of the uh, tab each of the other tables on top of it. And this does a couple of things for us. Uh, first off, it reduces the amount of the search space of different plans. It essentially forces us to one specific parenthesization of the queries. So now the order in which I give the different relations fixes the, um, the structure of the query plan. So it reduces me from n factorial factorial to just n factorial. Um, second, it makes using index nested loop join a lot easier because now what's uh, every single one of these uh, every single one of these joins has at least one table uh, one input that's sitting on top of a, a table so I could literally change any of these into an index nested loop join if I had an appropriate index and finally, this also works nicely with hybrid hash join because I can build uh, indexes for, excuse me, I can build hash tables for, in this case, S, T, and U, and then just stream all the tuples of U up through these hash tables. So essentially, by fixing my join... I can fix the structure of my join, and this tends to make optimization quite a bit easier for a number of reasons. Any questions on left deep plans? Yeah. Uh, so the uh, question is, can I repeat the last point with respect to streaming? Um, so. If I have a hash table built for S, T, and R, then each of the join operations, or the, the get next tuple uh, for each of these join operations, ends up Ah, OK. Let me back up and note one thing. So System R targets a type of query. Um, System R targets analytics queries, or with this specific optimization, is targeting uh, queries that ask about big data. Um, and very frequently in uh, relational data, you're going to encounter uh, what's known as a star schema. A star schema is kind of this. Uh, thing where you have a really big central table and then a lot of these uh, a central uh, fact table and a lot of these what are called dimension tables. The dimension tables kind of give small bits of uh, additional information about uh, various attributes. So a, sim a simple example would be uh, log data for um, a whole bunch of web pages and then you might have uh, what's a dimension table that kind of gives you additional information, let's say for each web page, uh, additional information for um, different users that might be accessing those web pages. So 
TPCH is actually one great example of this, where you have the line items is kind of the central, well, mumble, mumble. Um, but a lot of the queries in TPCH operate over line items, looking at individual features and in line items, and then kind of branching off to uh, the corresponding order that corresponds to the line item, branching off to the part that corresponds to that line item, branching off to the uh, supplier that supplied that line item. Okay, why am I going off onto this tangent? This is because the dimension tables are typically much smaller. And, I mean, line item is this huge table that's about 10 times as big as the next largest table. Now, if I put that all the way on the left and have my smaller tables kind of up along the chain, it's sometimes, although not always, easier to build a in-memory hash table for those smaller relations. So those smaller relations, especially if you have uh, foreign key relationships to the smaller tables, what I meant by streaming is that you start with you know, this big central table, and then you uh, join it on one foreign key, you join it on another foreign key, you join it on another foreign key, and so forth. And you treat the kind of side tables. That, that's basically all I meant, that if you have a really, really big table, um, hybrid hash join works very well if one side of the hash table is built and the other side kind of goes up the, the chain. Yeah? Yeah. Yes, so um, kind of the, the big point here is that a left deep plan is kind of one specific restricted form of plan. Normally, I'd have to deal with not just the order of the tables, but the parenthesization as well. And I could have um, well, n-1 factorial different ways of, so for every plan, I could have n-1 factorial different ways of parenthesi parenthesizing it. So in total, I'd get n factorial times n-1 factorial, different possible plans. So it is, uh, the question is, is it always possible to do this? Um, what if you have a subselect statement? Um, in that case, the subselect would either take the place of one of these relations, or you could always normalize uh, by pushing all of your... So I could always take a projection operation and push it up above the join, right? I can always uh, take a selection operation, push it up above the join. You can always take a sort, push that all the way to the top of my query because isn't anything uh, that I actually need from that. So essentially, I could always turn any query into some combination of unions and joins, and essentially, I can basically turn any query into this, into this normal form by pushing the selection projection up and then renormalizing it this way. Whether you actually need to or not, I mean, again, optimization is one of these things that you, the, you can put a lot of effort into it, um, but at some point you hit a point of diminishing returns. So um, the, the two answers to your question are, uh, yes, you can always normalize the query into this form. No, you don't necessarily always want to because may not necessarily be useful. Of course, then you can't do index scans or what have you. Any other questions? All right. So main takeaway here, this is one way of simplifying your optimization strategy. Uh, because otherwise, you'd have to evaluate costs for another n minus 1 factorial different types of plans. 
OK. So I'm going to transition into another area. And last lecture, we talked about uh, one specific assumption or one specific type of statistic that um, would help us optimize. What was it? What kind of information were we assuming that we had about each of our base data tables last time? Domain information, upper and lower bounds, or some sort of information about the extremes, or at least the number of possible values that my variables could take. And this uh, allows us to make an assumption uh, that the data is uniformly distributed, or uh, this gives us enough information that we can build a uniform, uh, that we can assume uh, that the data is uniformly distributed, and using a uniform this, this assumption, we can make a couple of guesses about how much the plan is going to cost. But this is a really, really strong assumption, uh, and often not super great. Data is often kind of skewed. So a uniform distribution can kind of sort of characterize the data that we're working with. It gives us a starting point to do estimation. But we can do more. And in order to do more, we need more detailed information about how the different data values are distributed. So let me give you an example. Here I have a bunch of data, and I have a bunch, uh, and I have two different queries. So looking at the first of those queries, uh, select name from people where rank is 3 and age is 20. What kind of options do I have for uh, indexing that would help me with this query? Yeah. OK, so we could build a, a hash index on what? Hmm? Rank and age. OK, so if we had a hash index on rank and a hash index on age, we could uh, reduce the cost of this query. And the cost reduction, well, last time we talked about this, was uh, in terms of a reduction factor. How much is the data going to be reduced? Now we have four different ages and three different um, and three different, excuse me, um, eight different, no, there is, ah, excuse me, uh, we have four different ages and three different ranks. Now, for this So if we have a selection on rank and a selection on age, how would we guess what the reduction factor is for each of these? So if we have three, what is that? If we have four different ages, what's my reduction factor for a selection on age? OK, so if we make this uniform assumption, then we divide by 1 over 4. We're selecting one value out of four possible values. Uniform assumption, 1 fourth. So we, we would technically reduce the uh, total. And I think there's a typo there. That should be 1 third. Yeah. So. How would we do the same thing for rank? Well, there are three possible values. We make a uniform assumption, and the, uh, the number of possible ranks, excuse me, we, we would expect to select out um, uh, from the three different 
pages, we'd expect to select out um, one third of the tuples. Okay, so we have two different reduction factors, um, and age is lower. One fourth is less than one third. So based on that, age would win out. And we're reducing the number of tuples by one fourth. That's obviously better. So is that always going to be the case? Yeah. Uh, so the reduction factor is the percentage of tuples that survive. So you're, uh, if you're assuming a uniform distribution and there are four possible values, you get a one in four chance of hitting a tuple with the rank, uh, excuse me, with the age you're looking for, and you have a one in three chance of hitting a tuple with the rank that you're looking for. So you obviously don't want to hit tuples because you want to get rid of as many as possible. So uh, one in four chance is lower and therefore better. Does that address your uh, question? Okay. So let's look at the actual data. Does that match up? Oh, actually, hold on a second. I'm not sure how this typo is in. This is today's watchfulness exercise. Um, okay, does that actually work out? So what if we pick ages 20? What would our actual reduction factor be? Half. So there are four tuples that have, uh, or that have an age of 20. There are only three tuples that have a rank. Excuse me. That that is where that came from. There are three tuples out of the eight that have a rank of, uh, of three. So in, for 20, we're actually doing worse by picking the, the age index. Same thing if we were go to, to go with 19. 19 is kind of wildly skewed in the other direction, where we're actually reducing um, way more than we actually thought. Okay, main takeaway from this, uniform distribution is good, but we could potentially do better. And in order to do better, we need at least some statistics about the distribution of values for each attribute. So as I'm sure you've guessed by now, the title section is histograms. So we're going to try and estimate that distribution or, or uh, describe that distribution uh, with uh, what's called a histogram. So not sure uh, how many of you rem remember from st uh, statistics or um, the corresponding math classes. A histogram is basically a summary of how many different instances uh, of a given range, uh, how many different instances, histogram is a way of summarizing a set of records by counting how many instances uh, have a given value or fall into a given range. So using our, uh, so you, as an example, I might have a histogram that describes a bunch of data, um, and this describes 10 different records of which one has the attribute 19, two have the attribute 20, four have the attribute 21, uh, attribute value 21, and one has a value of 22. Now this is fine if I have four different attribute values. I may mean, actually want to keep detailed statistics about every single possible value. Is that always going to be feasible? Okay, and you guys are just, no! Come on, wait, get some coffee before class or something. No, come on, no. Okay, 
Why, why did you just say no? It could take a lot of space. So if my attribute is an integer, well, I'm not going to store int max different uh, integer values. Um, there's lots and lots of different uh, values. So a histogram could also cover ranges. And what happens here is, well, you can store a histogram in a couple of different ways. Um, one way to store it is to store the average value of the histogram over the entire range. So going back to that first diagram, there are, um, if I were to randomly pick an attribute in the range 19 to 20, one or two, the average of those two uh, is 1.5. So rather than storing both of those values, I could simply store uh, 1.5. Same deal with 4 and 1. The average of those is 2.5. So now I have uh, a smaller amount of data that describes all of my information a little bit less accurately. Now at the extreme, I take the average over everything, and I just store one value. That says, OK, on average, there are going to be two values for every single uh, there are going to be two records for every single attribute value in the range 19 to 22. And this is just our bounds. We have a lower bound, we have an upper bound, and we have an average number of records at each individual point. So this is one way of storing it. The other way is to store the total number of records in that range. What would that be here? 10. Okay, let's wake you guys up, do an example. Let's say that I've gathered the, this histogram about my data. And I want to do a selection, um, give me all records where A is 33. How many records would I expect to see? Less than or equal to 30? What do you mean by less? Oh, uh, what do you mean by less than or equal to? Or why less than or equal to? Yeah? Because the range between 30 and 40, total number of uh, records between 30 and 40 are 13. Ah, OK. So uh, the, so you're make, uh, so that actually should have been a question. Which representation am I using here? Am I using the total number of records that fall into that range, or am I using the average number of records for every attribute? Well, let's say that I'm using um, the total number of records. So the, if the total number of records stored for the range 30 to 40 is 30, then I have an upper bound on the number of records. So there's at most 30. Can I do better? Can I come up with an expected number of records? Hmm? Yeah, so if you assume a uniform distribution in the range 30 to 40, then on average, every single attribute value in that range is going to have three records. So in this case, I'm going to get three records out of um, how many in total? No, I'm not going to make you add all that. Uh, should be about 170. So there are 170 records, and three out of those get returned by the query. So my reduction factor is three out of 170. All right, let's make this a little more uh, more interesting. What if I'm asking for the number of records greater than 33? And again, assume that the numbers here are the total number of records. So how would I go about computing this? Uh, yeah, speak up. OK, so I could have, at most, 30 plus 21 plus 63 plus 10 plus 10, because the um, 
Well, uh, records in the range 40 to 50 are guaranteed to be in my result. Same thing for 50 to... Uh, that, that, that is today's other watchfulness exercise. Fifty to sixty, sixty to seventy, seventy to eighty. So anything bigger than fifty, or excuse me, bigger than forty, is guaranteed to be in my result. Could I come up with an expected number of tuples? Okay. So because I'm guaranteed to have. Uh, everything bigger than 40 in my result set. All right, 21 plus 63 plus 10 plus 10, those tuples are guaranteed in my result set. Now, if we make a uniform distribution assumption over th the range 30 to 40, then that gives us, uh, what is that, about 74 per, um, uh, 40 minus 33, seven uh, records, so 21 different um, expected records in um, that range. Okay, so 21 plus 21 plus 63 plus 10 plus 10, and that gives us a reduction factor of somewhere in the vicinity of uh, three quarters. All right, that was kind of a whirlwind tour. Any questions on histograms and using histograms to estimate selectivities? Um, for the lower bound, can you assume that everything is between 30 and 32? Um, yeah, that would... Uh, so the, the question is, if you're trying to estimate not just the expected value, but the bounds of um, how many tuples you could return, then uh, you would essentially have to make worst case or best case assumptions about um, either end of the range. So in the, the worst case, or the least number of, t in order to get the least number of tuples, then that would essentially be all of the tuples are less than, uh, sorry, all of the tuples in the range 30 to 40 fall into that, or skewed towards 30 or 31. The, uh, uh, in which case, you'd get zero tuples out of that bucket. The other end of the spectrum, all of the tuples fall into the, uh, are greater than 33. You get 30 tuples. So you can get potentially upper and lower, uh, reasonable upper and lower bounds with relatively high, uh, relatively small variances um, for inequality predicates. That's a good observation. Uh, considering that the uniform distribution is, uh, is, is rare, um, what do you mean by concept? How does the concept change? Um, how, does it, uh, how does the expected reduction factor change? So essentially the difference here is that you have a more precise notion of the selectivity. Um, if I were to take the total number of tuples in here, 170, and I, the total range, 0 to 80, that gives me a very coarse uh, view of how many instances of each individual tuple there are. This basically gives us a better way of estimating how many tuples there are in individual, for individual values, or for individual attribute values. So I could, if I was to say, uh, try and find the reduction factor for A is equal to 15, 
normally that would be one out of a uh, eighty, one out of uh, a reduction factor of one out of eighty, because eighty possible values, fifteen is one of those values, and if I don't have any additional information, then I'd expect all of my, uh, I'd expect everything to return one out of. On the other hand, if I, we, in this case, if we have more detailed information. Um, we're still making a uniform distribution assumption over certain ranges. But within those ranges, the ranges are much smaller, so we can get a much more accurate, uh, more, much more reliable view of the reduction factor within that range. So essentially, the reduction factor here within the range 10 to 20 is uh, zero because it doesn't let anything through. The reduction factor between uh, 20 to 30 is 15 over 170, because 15 out of 170 tuples fall into that range. Does that address your question? Yeah. Ah, OK, so that's a great observation. Um, the a histogram, let me rephrase that slightly. So a histogram is a statistic about base data. And if you have that statistic, great. Um, you can do all sorts of optimization based on it. But having a statistic, just like having an index or having any other uh, additional metadata, makes it more expensive to maintain. So if the data is consistently changing, you either need to update your histogram or you need to, or just like you'd need to update your index, just like you'd need to update any additional piece of metadata. And if you, well, you basically now have two choices. You either spend more effort uh, upfront maintaining this index or you, or excuse me, maintaining these statistics or you don't maintain them and pay the, uh, the corresponding cost by having less optimized queries. Does that address your answer? So again, everything, uh, I said this at the, at the start of the term, everything in this class is all it, a matter of trade-offs and finding the best way to make different kinds of trade-offs. And this is one thing to help you make those trade-offs when deciding ab about query plans. But whether or not this is useful really depends on how much benefit you expect to get out of it. OK. So we talked about, so we've talked about histograms. We've talked about uniform distribution assumptions. There's two other things that we uh, brought up as ways of doing cost-based optimization or doing uh, cost, well, not cost-based optimization, but doing um, optimization of cases where you need these reduction factors. First, I'm just going to remind, uh, remind you that you can use constraints. Any constraint that uh, the user has given you gives you additional information about the data that you can potentially use in order to make optimization decisions. We've seen one of those constraints, domain constraints. Um, key constraints and foreign key constraints are also really useful for this purpose. So a foreign key constraint, like we said last week, gives you uh, an exact reduction factor for a join operation. A key attribute tells you that if you ask for one instance of that attribute, you're getting back exactly one tuple. Also, incredibly useful information. And if you have um, a cascading constraint relationship, then that means that these are being enforced, so you can get even more precise uh, information about, uh, the, about how, um, how many tuples you're going to get back from a join or a selection predicate. Well, a join in particular. All right. Quick pass since we already kind of covered this. Any questions here? Yeah. Uh, 
How would a foreign key constraint be useful? So if I have a join where the foreign key constraint is my join predicate, I'm, it, I'm doing a join on the uh, key equals foreign key, how many tuples am I going to get back for, uh, for that, assuming that I have n rows in the, the key table, or the, the table being referenced? Uh, so let's say I have R of A, uh, where A is a key, and S of A, where So let's say I have really simple, two really simple, t uh, can you guys see that? Um, two simple tables, R of A and S of A, where S of A, uh, where R of A is a key and S of A is a foreign key reference to A. So if I have R join S on A, how many tuples am I getting back? Exactly. So this join, I can basically ignore, if I know that this is a foreign key attribute, I can pretty much ignore this for the cost, uh, for uh, when computing the reduction factor. Because this is bas the reduction factor of this cross product is just going to be, the no or the, not the reduction factor, but the, the number of tuples that this uh, join produces is going to be the number of tuples in S. Does that address your question? Okay, so the last thing we're going to cover today is sampling. And loosely put, uh, sampling is just take a bunch of tuples from each data source, uh, run a couple of different query plans on each of them, see which one works, now that you've done that, you now have some estimates for the reduction factors of each operator in the query plan. So, oh. okay. So if I'm doing sampling, if I'm just running a bunch of, uh, of queries, excuse me, a bunch of query plans on small sampled subsets of the data, well, what kind of problems might I run into? The sample is, okay, so the, the biggest problem that I have is picking a representative sample, picking a couple of samples, or uh, excuse me, picking a sample that accurately represents the, the data that I'm querying. Okay, that is actually a surprisingly difficult problem, um, especially since, um, Typically, in order to get such a representative sample, you need ra to randomly access your data. Well, random access is horrible. But assuming that you do have that, generating a representative sample um, requires you also to know how big a representative sample. So if I say, you know, you just pick a bunch of, of tuples from the, the table, well, if I pick one tuple from each table, that doesn't necessarily help me. If I pick too, basically if I pick too few tuples, then I don't get a reasonably representative sample. If I pick too many, then I'm spending way too much time running these query plans. So this is kind of the first problem. And, nope. Well, Realistically, no one has come up with a good solution to this. Um, I'll, I have a couple of uh, pointers to reference material uh, if you're interested in this. Um, it's actually a really, really challenging problem. Um, but let's say, hypothetically, that you've, picked, you've done some heuristic testing, you've picked a couple of, uh, of samples, 
what other problems might we run into? Yeah. Okay, so any error that, uh, what do you mean by any error that occurs during the sampling? I see. Um, so uh, let me uh, let me make it clear. The problem. Uh, so the goal here is to est not to compute the query result using samples. The goal here is to estimate the reduction factors in each operation. So you might use a histogram to get kind of a first pass approximation of the the result. Uh, uh, excuse me. A first pass approximation of uh, which queries are are reasonable. But you wouldn't necessarily get any kind of error from that because the um, because the the uh, all you're doing is picking a query plan. Um, once you pick it, then you actually run it and get some reasonable results. Oh wow, we are running out of time. So okay. Um, they're basically, when you're, uh, when you're using sampling to try and estimate reduction factors, really kind of the big problem, uh, or all of the, the big problems that you run into, essentially reduce to having insufficient data. Because every single, uh, there's a whole bunch of operators that are essentially geared towards removing data. You want to do this. You want to get rid of as much data as possible, so picking uh, so, especially in good plans, um, those are going to be the plans that get rid of the most data as early as possible. Simple example, if you have a really selective predicate, and this is a great thing normally, uh, but if you have a really selective predicate, um, read 100 tuples and uh, that selective predicate just completely blasts away all of your sampled uh, sample tuples, now you have absolutely zero information about operators further up in the pipeline. And this kind of also comes up with respect to joins, because a join is going to uh, result in a, <coughs> well, presumably a very selective predicate, but a predicate that you would frequently expect to see satisfied. And in an example like the one up on the board, R of A, S of A, there's only one match, but finding that one specific match uh, for every tuple in S is something that you're not likely to see if you just have a completely random sample of tuples from A and a random sample uh, of R from R and a random sample of tuples from B. Uh, this is commonly known as the, birth, uh, the birthday problem or the birthday paradox in statistics. Uh, and essentially what it means is that you need the square root of R uh, plus S tuples in order to reliably guess a reduction factor for that uh, join. And that's square root you know, is a pretty, pretty uh, good way of reducing the number of tuples that you need to sample, but it's still freaking huge. Uh, and the last thing is in aggregation, um, aggregation, estimating the number of output groups is really, really tricky. So how many groups are you going to get out of an aggregate? Well, that depends on how many groups there are in the data. Um, so if there's a small number of groups in the data, well, then you see all of them at once. You get kind of these small numbers of very populated groups um, from your sample. With a large number of groups, you might only see a small fraction in a given sample. And this is tricky. Um, one way to kind of uh, address this is to figure out kind of a histogram for uh, the, the fill of each group. If you see groups that are really, really full, well, that probably means that you have a small number of groups. On the other hand, you run into what's known as the long tail problem in statistics, where uh, there is a very large number of really, really infrequent groups. So, um, 
this has kind of been a whirlwind uh, pass through sampling. Um, and kind of the really, what I find really cool about uh, sampling is that it's an area that really doesn't have good solutions to it. Um, picking an appropriate sample size, even the statisticians don't ha uh, only use rule of thumb uh, solutions for this. Uh, and there's been a lot of work in, in databases about ways of kind of teasing out good approaches to sampling. Um, one kind of cool actual system that you can play with, uh, Pig Latin, a uh, feature of Hadoop, has uh, a application called Pigpen that actually does this kind of sampling. So it will show you an, uh, a summary of, well, so Pig Latin is kind of a query language, and this query language gives you uh, for every step uh, you can think of it as every query that you pose in it, it gives you kind of a summary of the output. And the way it does that, in spite of the join, uh, the, these birthday paradox issues, is to do the sampling in kind of an intelligent way. And if you're interested in that, uh, I urge you to take a look at the paper Pig Latin, not so foreign language for something, something, something. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other really cool uh, resources on, on uh, ways of using sampling for uh, aggregate estimation, ways of using sampling for kind of summarizing data, uh, all over the place. And if you're interested in this, also swing by my office, have a chat. All right, um, thank you, and I'll see everyone on Friday.